Okay, um, welcome everyone to uh, another of the, the seminars in the Value in Health Week. Um, and the one this afternoon, or the first one this afternoon, is on bringing data to life. So thanks very much for uh, for attending. Um, I'm uh, sorry, if you could just go back, uh, please, Gareth, because uh, I was going to read off that opening slide, thanks. Um, so uh, you're going to hear briefly from me at the beginning, uh, just for five or ten minutes to try and set a bit of context. Um, and then I'm going to introduce uh, some other speakers. Um, Ian Bell, who's Director of Public Health Data Knowledge and Research from Public Health Wales, is going to speak after me. Um, and then after Ian, we're going to hear from another couple of people. Uh, Chris Haberley, Senior Project Manager at the National Data Resource Project uh, based in DHCW. And Navjot Kalra, who's the Assistant Director of Digital Transformation and also the Head of Value Based Healthcare um, in uh, Swansea and the Value and Health team. Um, so, OK, you can, uh, we'll have time for Q's and A's at the end, um, but we're going to just go in sequence before we have the Q&A section at the end. If you can uh, put the slides up now, uh, Gareth, thanks. So uh, those of you that don't know me, uh, my clinical background is as a consultant in paediatric intensive care in Cardiff, where I've been for uh, 20 odd years. And um, currently I'm in an interim post as a national clinical director to take forward the implementation of the national clinical framework. And it's a, a little bit of that context that I'm going to set. Uh, next slide, please. So my, my clinical background um, I made me think about what matters to me as far as data is concerned. Um, and my, my clinical background in paediatric critical care made data actually quite important throughout that part of my career. So I used to look after critically ill children. That felt important. It felt like a big responsibility, but it caused me to ask some questions. How, how did I know that the, the unit I was working in, the team I was working with, were doing a good job. And what was the best unit to, to work in? When I started training, I was working in Great Ormond Street uh, PICU. That's obviously the best, isn't it? Or is it? Was it Alder Hay? Was, was it Birmingham? Um, actually, are bigger units better than smaller units? And when I started in PICU in the, the late 90s, these were questions being asked very publicly in the wake of the Bristol Heart Inquiry um, and some high profile uh, PICU cases in the northwest of England. So I, I learned uh, that there was probably no such thing as the best because you have to ask best at what? Um, and that's not always clear. Um, the, the concept of having league tables for units was debunked or certainly should have been debunked completely. Uh, by one of my favourite papers, Gareth Parry and colleagues produced um, in the, the late 90s, looking at neonatal units in Scotland uh, and demonstrating that you, you can't make meaningful league, table, uh, league tables for healthcare outcome data. Um, and I became involved in PICANET, which was the National Audit Organisation for PICU. And I was a clinical advisory group member for 15 years uh, in, in, in that entity. And we didn't use league tables. We moved into a world of uh, funnel plots um, the language of outliers and uh, performance in line with a risk adjusted model comparable to peers. And um, that started to be the language I talked about. It's not easy and um, it's not easy for uh, the public. It's not easy for politicians and managers sometimes to understand, but it's the right way of doing things. And then we went on to move to, uh, later to use David Spiegelhalter's work um, interestingly on Harold Shipman, as well as the, the Bristol Inquiry, to, to go beyond annual reporting and into early warning indicators using data. I'm telling you that um, because I want to emphasise that I'm not a mathematician, I'm not a statistician, and I'm not a data scientist. But I did learn about all of these techniques and their usefulness, and they became relevant to my day-to-day -day practice um, beca because I worked alongside these people as part of my clinical job. And I think this is going to be increasingly important as we move forward, certainly in terms of delivery of the, the national clinical framework. 
And before I move on to this slide, I should just add that question about big units and small units. It turns out that size doesn't matter, um, which is not what people thought at the, the start of the process. Next slide, please. So the National Clinical Framework um, de describes a, a need for data and it outlines how we use data to build a learning health and care system. Um, so that learning health and care system is still built on the foundations of prudent health care, but the way that prudent health care is put into effect is through the tools of value based health care. Next slide, please. The framework itself relates to and interfaces with other related strategies, plans and initiatives. And although it's maybe not a hierarchical relationship, the National Clinical Framework is something that uh, it's a point of coalescence for all of these other plans and strategies to centre around. Next slide, please. So each of the actions uh, laid out are considered through the perspectives of what needs to be done at a national level, um, at a local system level, and what the, the roles of individual healthcare professionals are. And although listed as discrete actions, there, there's quite considerable overlap uh, be, between the, the themes and requirements for each of those actions. Just click on to the next slide now. So briefly, um, the, the actions here address questions like how do we organise our system? How do we provide a central guiding hand function to shape it? Who is it we're caring for and where do they live? That's the population health part. And how do we care for them? How do we measure what we do? How do we become clinically led and um, particularly agnostic of professional group and, and location when we're planning things at national level, but actually allowing and permitting local organisations to address those aspects when they're putting healthcare pathways into effect. And then what we're going to come on to discuss today, which is the, the tools for understanding and analysing data. Next slide, please. I'm just briefly going to uh, show you a, a schematic diagram. In the National Clinical Framework document, there are a couple of pictures at the beginning of the document that describe a kind of target operating model for the system. And I've tried to combine the two into, into one diagram that makes it a bit clearer. Uh, next slide, please. I'm not going to talk through this in detail, but hopefully it becomes apparent that what we're talking about is a system where national clinical networks describe how, uh, how we ought to deliver services, the outcomes against which those services will be held to account, and a delivery mechanism through healthcare pathways. And deliberately writ large on this slide is the concept of a data platform that allows us to collect this data in one conceptual place and then start to turn the data into information and knowledge. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Action 10 of the National Clinical Framework because this relates to the enabling digital strategy um, and the requirement that this is refreshed to recognise the importance of that common data platform, the national data resource, and the move towards an open architecture. Next slide, please. So the data to knowledge cycle driving the system is made possible by shared and linked data. Next slide. And that shared and, net, and, and uh, linked data exists in the national data resource. So that's the foundation of that common data platform, structured granular data in a single place that all those with appropriate access can actually interact with. It's conceptually in a single place, and in reality, this is going to reside in a cloud, uh, which is, uh, you know, those of you technically in the audience know is a collection of servers, both on, on premise and off premise. But just think about it conceptually as being in one place. So there's patient identifiable data ready for operational use, both for individual interactions, but also collectively. Um, for example, in uh, patient flow systems that are starting to appear in some hospitals in Wales. 
The data could then be imagined as uh, being stripped of personal identifiers, uh, but still remaining linked. Uh, and that data in that outer layer can be made available for research use and system planning purposes, similar to the, the sale environment uh, that exists in uh, Swansea at the moment, uh, but uh, much more readily accessible to those in the service. The, the NDR itself has been delayed um, in its uh, production by COVID, like many things, but things are really starting to move again quite rapidly. Uh, click, please. The development of, sorry, if you could uh, click, uh, Gareth, or sorry, I, I was looking at the wrong uh, slide there. Uh, the development of the data promise by colleagues in Welsh Government, um, led by the Chief Digital Officer, is going to provide um, some information governance assurance for the public and enable the system uh, to, to become one where we can access that outer layer of data for use in research. But probably of more important uh, or more immediate importance to many of us um, present today is making that identifiable, actionable data available and visible um, for, for us to use. And, and that's about putting into place the architectural building blocks, uh, things like fire APIs um, using open air as a, a data persistence layer. Um, and, and this is starting to happen now. This is the basis for the open architecture. And what that does is moves us into a plug and play environment for patient facing and clinician facing applications, as well as some of the analytic tools we might want to use without being tethered to particular systems or locked in to specific suppliers for long periods of time. Uh, next slide, please. So what we're going to talk about today is um, this analytic part of the, the journey, and that's what we're going to hear about from our presenters. Um, the, the data to knowledge section of the learning health and care system. Next slide, please. Maybe the most important fundamental to grasp is that turning data to information and knowledge is a multi-step process. The data doesn't just magically transform into a, a series of Eureka insights. It requires people with different skill sets, not, not working in isolation from each other, but working together and definitely working with clinicians. Visualisation of the data is a really good um, and important first step, uh, but that's only the first step. We have to talk about how we make sense of it, um, how we work out what it's saying. And this is where clinicians and analysts, um, using both terms uh, in, in a very broad sense, need to come together. I think we do have capability within the system to do this, but we definitely don't have capacity at the moment. And if we want to do it properly, we definitely need to build that capacity. And that's not to say that we can't improve our capability as well. That doesn't just mean more analysts. Uh, it, it means clinical time for doing the, the data to knowledge work. Um, and, and it's not just a central function either. It has to be devolved um, and it's a distributed function right down to individual clinical team level. Um, and just as I was finishing up in my CCIO role in Cardiff recently, uh, a couple of the clinical teams were actually employing full-time data scientists uh, into their clinical teams so that they could start to take the, the next steps on this journey. Next slide, please. So I did mention dashboards uh, and we'll see lots of them this week. I'm sure we've seen a few already. And um, there's uh, a bit of a dashboard fetish at the moment, and I'm a, I'm a dashboard fetishist uh, at some level, but we definitely need to move beyond that. Um, sometimes think there's a lot of people that fancy uh, that their environment and the, their health board will have a, a bridge like the Starship Enterprise with a, an array of screens and all the required information will be there. By all means, fill your boots and create something like that, but that, that only gives you um, insights into the first layer of understanding of data. So dashboards, like uh, other ways of interrogating the data, underpinning them, can tell us some of what's happening, but they generally ask more questions than provide answers. But, but that's their utility and their important questions. Experience from organisations that have got mature digital EPRs, and I've had them for a long time, suggests it takes around about a decade to become a really mature 
learning health and care system. Um, but we know even in the early stages that uh, we immediately become uh, much better informed or able to make much uh, better informed decisions. Um, and, and I think it's quite exciting that we're taking the first few steps on this journey. Next slide. So I just wanted to emphasise before I, I hand over to Ian um, the point about the shared space for clinicians and analysts. And that my experience is that, that many clinicians have got a hunger for data, uh, but aren't quite sure what the data they want is. They just know they want some um, or, or what it might look like. Sometimes they're so starved of data that you could uh, serve up dog food uh, and uh, they'll tuck in. Uh, but then eventually realise, well, maybe this isn't what we thought we were asking for, um, and, and, and maybe it's inaccurate or maybe it's re misrepresenting reality. Um, and if we persist with this model of, you know, sort of telephoned or emailed requests for data, we, we, we won't build understanding. Um, and if we rely on conversations uh, using proxies between these two groups, we're not going to move forward. Uh, next slide, please. So instead, uh, we need to come together into the same conceptual place, uh, and that might be the same literal place when I was talking about those uh, having data scientists embedded with clinical teams. Um, you come together, you have a much more informed conversation. There's definitely a place in that space for uh, people like me and Sally, who are informaticians, graduates of the NHS Digital Academy, and th there's a lot more to follow. And Wales now has its own digital academy, which is developing that skill set uh, in the broad range of staff within the health and care system. So my vision for the future is that, that many of our multidisciplinary clinical teams will actually start to incorporate data science and analytics capability on a day to day basis over the, the next decade. We're definitely good at talking the talk and we have been talking this talk for a few years. It's also fair to say that we've started to walk the walk as well. Uh, and I think our presenters that, that are following me are going to talk about some of the steps that we're taking on that journey. So I'd like to hand over now to Ian um, and I'll speak to you again at the end during the Q&As. Thanks, Ian. Thanks very much, Alan. I'm going to pick it up there from the point of view of why now in the, this stage of the pandemic, value in health and data become even more vital to us and not just in the clinical sense but also in the wider public health uh, system as well and in order to do it i thought i might bring some data to life now i'm not sure where it sits but i'm hoping it's at least good quality dog food using alan's um, <laughs> metaphor there in it and so what i wanted to do is begin by a bit of an overview about actually where are we at in wales as a nation and why this value-based healthcare system actually matters so much so starting off with gareth next slide yeah then actually we see that Wales has an ageing population and a low fertility rate. Dependency ratio will worsen in the future with working age population shrinking and therefore we're going to see an ongoing pressure coming through into the system unless we begin to tackle wider uh, health harming behaviours and keep people healthier longer. You can see just from the slide there, but by 2043, we expect almost a million people in Wales to be over 65 plus. And compared to 2002, it will almost treble the number of folk who are 85 and over. And during the pandemic, the fertility rate in Wales fell still further. And so we, we will see this ongoing trend of an ageing population and more so in Wales than the rest of the UK. And so we combine that actually with how were we doing in the health overall, Gareth? And moving on, we can see that we had a system which had long and persistent health inequalities, which COVID-19 has exacerbated. COVID-19 death rate is stark. For women, it's nearly twice as high in women living in the most deprived areas compared to those living in the least deprived. And equally, many of the health harming behaviours show that deprivation curve. Quarter of uh, smoke in the most deprived fifth uh, areas compared to one in 10 in the least deprived. 
a third of beast in the most deprived areas compared to uh, one in five in the least deprived. And those inequalities have been stark ongoing and actually got, if anything, the pandemic has exacerbated those inequalities in the system. And so moving on. And we can see that actually even before we got to the pandemic, the improvements in um, healthy life expectancy and life expectancy in England and Wales had plateaued. And so even pre pandemic, we weren't particularly in the healthiest of states. And for some of the more deprived areas, we were already seeing that uh, the decades long improvements in life expectancy had come to an end and indeed were falling. And so moving on. You can see that that then currently fed through into the our nation being a place where a third of people follow less than three of the five healthy behaviours. And there's, I'm not going to read through them all, but there's some startling uh, statistics in there about health and well-being. Just a th less than a third of adults reported they, at least, they ate at least the five portions of fruit or veg the previous day. Half of adults reported they had done at least 150 minutes of exercise in the week. And just over a third reported a healthy weight at all. Now, if you bear what the, in mind what the pandemic's done, those are stark figures about actually the health and the ongoing impact this is going to have. And so, next slide. And the pandemic had other impacts through loneliness increased significantly, particularly during lockdowns. And even although we've come out of the lockdowns, actually loneliness has uh, is still well above the pre-pandemic levels. Again, this will have stark impacts on health, well-being. Um, and it was in that space of up around 70% during some uh, some lockdowns were reporting feeling lonely. Really quite worrying figures. And even now it's not back down to the 50% it was before. Next slide. And of course the pandemic had other impacts. We see here that when we hit the dotted line, this is uh, the waiting times for uh, treatment. Pre to the first case of COVID-19, it was down around five, six percent, uh, having to wait more than 36 weeks. It's now up at 37 percent, and although this chart hasn't updated a bit, it's still at 37 percent now in the latest figures, having to wait over 36 weeks for the treatment. And so if I kind of summarise a little of what I'm seeing here so far. It's a nation where healthy life expectancy and life expectancy had stalled. A lot of health harming behaviours in the system and a pandemic which exacerbated inequalities and now with growing delays and waits for treatment. So next slide. And of course there's wider determinants to health. We know good work matters. And while employment and unemployment rates are recovering well after uh, at this stage, we're not we're getting strong evidence through through things like job seekers allowance and uh, universal credit that the quality of the work and financial security may not be as strong. So while unemployment is almost back at pre uh, the levels before the pandemic, the numbers on job seekers allowance or universal credit actually remain well above pre pandemic, suggesting that increased financial insecurity. Next slide. And that was borne out by our survey we did on an ongoing basis to move to real time monitoring of what's happening uh, through Public Health Wales, with one in five adults saying their financial situation had worsened since the pandemic and 14% uh, saying their employment or work prospects had worsened. And that was particularly showing up in the younger age groups who were feeling this pressure in the wider in the area of work. Next slide. And we've already talked about um, some of the health harming behaviours and so far I've been very much in the territory of saying these have followed the deprivation curve and actually here. But to show how you have to dig into the data and really not get caught into some of the actually all follows deprivation type curves. Alcohol consumption didn't. 
So interestingly, uh, about 19, uh, about the same percentage reduced their alcohol consumption during the pandemic as increased it. But the groups who increased their alcohol consumption were not in the most deprived areas, uh, were not highest in the most deprived areas, but were highest actually in the least deprived areas in quintiles four and five. So there are differences and variations we need to understand and the harm of alcohol often still remains higher in the lower deprivation and it's drilling down and down into the data so that we get this actionable insight we need to do. So next slide. And of course, moving on to some of the other aspects, we can see physical fitness. A lot of people, 43% said their physical fitness is worse now. And that one did seem to be more female saying it's worse, pretty broadly consistent by age and some evidence it's slightly worse in the most deprived areas. Moving on. And a uh, weight increase. Um, 17% said they'd managed to do the healthy thing and uh, reduce weight during the pandemic. The 45% said it stayed the same and 38% said their weight had increased. Slight deprivation, but very strong amongst females that are going, that this has changed. Next slide. Now, what this has done is a canter through of a scenario here which we face in Wales. And Alan rightly pointed out the need for high quality information for clinicians, but we need high quality information to the whole public because fundamentally with the backlog in care which we're seeing building into the system, the build up in health harming behaviours, we have to undertake work which keeps and gets actionable work working in the community in order to keep people healthier for longer so that uh, we keep the pressure off the NHS and undertake it. And what you'll notice here is I've been great about telling you about all these health inequalities, but actually we have a really poor evidence base around what works for actually tackling health inequalities. And so we've got to move beyond describing the harms we see and into providing the information on what works in order to tackle these long-standing issues which are in there setting up rapid ways of evaluation so that we can test whether the interventions are working and doing it. And we've got to move beyond high highlighting problems. Too often we seem to find groups who are in some way disadvantaged for health reasons and actually then describe all the ways that put less into the evaluation and the solution mode. We've got to retake this balance so that we actually are finding the solutions and focusing on the outcomes which matter, i.e. keeping those healthy, healthy for longer, keeping those who might be on the path towards unhealthy behaviour, helping them lead a lifey, li healthy lifestyle again. And for those who are ill, providing interventions and treatments that work and work effectively. And that's why value and health as a framework with the clinical framework as well, working in partnership, become vital to the stage we're at. Because unless we can take a reality of this step into how we present data, bring it to life through some vis through visualization, as I've done attempted to do today, that move beyond it into what works, then we will continue to have an increased pressure in the system. Now, I am no expert in value in healthcare work, so I hand over now seamlessly to the person who is and hand over to Navjot in order to uh, talk through the intelligence for value framework. Navjot, over to you. Thank you, Ian, and thank you, Alan. I uh, really appreciate that. Right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Navjot, and um, I am a computer science engineer by background. Um, I, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed um, what Alan um, introduced a session which, uh, with, 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 which was um, what matters to our clinicians? Um, how do we see what good looks like? Uh, we mentioned things around um, intelligence for action, data for action. We mentioned things around fostering a shared language. And the topic of today is bringing data to life. So how do we, from the excellent um, work that Alan has done and Ian has described, 
get into the nitty gritty of getting our hands dirty and bringing um, all the requirements of the national clinical framework and 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 the and the um, the, the the salient things that 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 Ian mentioned to life. Um, next slide, please, um, Gareth. Um, so today my presentation is going to cover um, four things. I, I I chose I did not choose a number three, but four things. Um, so why are we doing this? Um, based on the vision of the program, what it is. How are we going to approach it? And as as um, as Alan mentioned, what's our target operating model? So, so th that that will form um, the the content of of this presentation today. So um, by now you all must have heard uh, the vision of the program, which is all about improving the health outcomes that matter most to the people in Wales, and that we will support this by asking people about their outcomes and creating a data driven system which seeks to provide the timely information to citizens, clinical teams and organizations to inform decision making that leads to those outcomes in a in a way that's financially sustainable. The question, the big question is how are we going to do it? Um, Gareth, next slide please. So, so when we talk about the component parts of, of, of that data driven system, um, the key things we're talking about is the data on clinical care and outcomes, the data on costs, and of course the interoperability that's required for one system to talk to the other so that data can be transmitted seamlessly across the systems. Um, Alan mentioned about case mix variables um, and other um, data sets which are really important, including patient reported outcome measures, which are the which 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 are really really important in this conversation, and of course um, audit and registry data sets, um, which which part which which form a part of those clinical outcomes um, data sets. Next slide, please, Gareth. So when we talk about the journey of the patient um, or the journey of the individual through the system, you can you can see that on on this particular slide, a patient travels through our system um, from generally presenting um, at their primary care, um, emergency departments, some sort of screening, and will then go through um, referrals, um, perhaps a specialist appointment, perhaps some tests, and then they um, they could go through various different forms of interventions, um, surgery, chemotherapy, recovery. They could go back into the system or they could come out of the system. Um, next slide, please, Gareth. And it's interesting to see that behind that journey, sits a rich set of data that's routinely captured to inform the care for the individuals um, and patients that we serve in our system. Um, there's a lot of abbreviations on the system on, on this on this sheet, which I which I will aspire to demystify a few of them for you. So the EDDS system, for example, collects all our information in accident and emergency centers. Um, the, the admitted patient care is when the patients get admitted. Uh, we collect um, data at, at those particular points. Um, and of course, we've got various different other data sets, including what Ian mentioned around population estimates. Um, Ian presented a lot about deprivation, which sits in the Welsh index of multiple deprivation. We've got the quality of life, disease prevalence, lifestyle factors, National Survey for Wales. So, so a lot of a lot of aggregated data sets um, sit um, sit in the in the system. Um, the reason why these are circled is it's an interesting observation is if we talk about um, the 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 concept for value and and the data sets that are required for answering questions relating to value. What does good look like? Um, what do I need to kind of improve the outcomes for my patients? Then 80% of these data sets which are circled red are in our gift. The ones that are also in our gift are the ones in the in, in the green boxes. Um, however, these might not be routinely submitted into a central um, place. So again, summary from the slide is the red ones are in our gift. We collect them routinely in one central place. The green ones, we collect them, but perhaps health boards are collecting them in different sort of ways. Um, the audit registry data um, is being collected, but not necessarily coming in one 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 um, central place. Next slide, please, Gareth. So here's here's the landscape in a in a very very simple way. We've got costing and activity data sitting somewhere else. We've got clinical and outcome registry data sitting somewhere else. We've got patient reported outcome measures sitting somewhere else. And as Alan described, well, 
there is a need for um, data standards and 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 the right interoperability, which is the fire and uh, the, the the fire protocol, etc., to to kind of mix and match this information so that it becomes meaningful. Next slide, please. Um, so now I've described to you a problem um, that we're trying to solve here. So we went about as a team trying to understand, well, um, you know, what is value and what does value mean to to people and what are the questions they're asking for value. Um, Ian um, and, 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 and Alan both touched upon a, a, a shared language, fostering shared language. As an analyst myself, as a, as a, as a, as a person who deals with data and information on a day to day basis, um, it, it was really important um, to understand what are the questions that the value in health, clinical networks, patients, clinicians, policymakers, etc., want answered. So we went out and we captured a vast amount of qu those questions already, and they will continue to inform our framework. Now we do know, as I described earlier, that there are a vast number of data sources needed to help us those um, answer those questions. And the great news is that we already have 80% of what we need. Um, and we know where and how to obtain the 20% as I alluded um, on, 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 on the previous slide. And we know how to treat the data once it's consumed um, around privacy, around data protection, and we know how to visualize the data. And I'm not talking about dashboards. Um, Ian and Alan will be pleased to know. Um, and of course, these answers support an informed change, which is all about data to action or reinforce good practice and ultimately improves patient outcomes. Next slide, please, Gareth. OK, so who are our stakeholders in, in NHS Wales? So all these, all, all, you know, our clinicians, our operational teams, our, man, our, our you know, our, our, our execs, our clinical networks, our researchers, our program managers. NHS is a wonderfully multidisciplinary um, organization and, and one size does not fit all. Um, there has to be a way to tailor information to the specific needs of people who view and digest information in different sorts of ways. So we went about as a program engaging with lots and lots of um, stakeholders in order to bring those um, jigsaw pieces together. Next slide, please. So here was our journey. Uh, we, we started um, collecting questions and scenarios from, from that stakeholder engagement, including um, doing several um, workshops with our clinical leads, our analytical teams, and actually um, understand what was the thematics emerging from, or the themes, I would say, emerging from all these questions. So we collated hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of questions. And out of those, the themes that emerged, next slide please, Gareth, um, so, so we, we, we brought all these together in, 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 in what is going to be the intelligence for value framework and the, the four themes, uh, the, the, sorry, the themes that emerged from this framework. Um, next slide, please, Gareth. Next one are um, clinical outcomes, cohort, cost activity, PROMS variation. Um, and it, it, was, it was that moment around thinking that Regardless of the number of questions that are being answered, the core theme of all those questions could be synthesized in these five themes. If you go on to the next slide, Gareth, please. OK, so what does that mean? So when we talk about clinical outcomes, uh, and this is just a sample of the questions, and this is to Alan's point, fostering that shared language between clinicians and our um, other operational teams. So when when somebody who's operational asks this question, um, does following an unadvised path in the unscheduled care system result in adverse outcomes for patients? Great question. Um, sometimes, and, and, and most of the times, the person who's asking the question perhaps doesn't know or is not aware of the data sets that are being routinely captured in order to answer that question. So on the right hand side, you can see the number of data sets that exist that can be triangulated in the appropriate way to answer that question. And they can answer questions like, can we measure if a drug interventions leads to an improvement in test results for the patients? Um, and on, on the top of this um, the screen, I'm so sorry, it's a bit hazy um, uh, um, right now, but, but, but those are the sort of visualizations. Um, Alan described a few methodologies around um, whisker, whisker plots, statistical process control, all really good way of analyzing information.
but this is slightly different. This is all about how we bring information out in a live environment so that people can use this information and use it for decision making um, there and then. So on, on, on the top of the screen, you can see the effects of treatment on one year mortality rates for heart failure patients. For example, the, 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 one, um, the one that were treated with beta blockers and the one that weren't treated with beta blockers. Um, next slide, please. Similarly for cohort, um, the questions um, could be, what is the quality of life for this patient group? How can we use data to help with triaging of care? These questions are asked by 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 all our you know our staff who are who who are there in the business of providing care to our patients, and it's really important that they get this information when they need them in the appropriate system, so that this information is built in clinical workflow and doesn't sit anywhere else. So the idea is to understand these questions, triangulate those data sets on the right hand side and be able to answer that question in a simple way. For example, on the top of the screen, you see the median waiting times for procedures for IBD patients so that when in a system people are looking at um, these times and they can they can they can um, perhaps look at their service provision, look at adjusting some of the things around. How do we how do we make this better? Next slide, please. Um, similarly, the questions around cost activity, um, which is all about how does the patient journey affect the cost? Are we over testing? How much is being spent on tests that are unnecessary? How much is spent due to unnecessarily avoidable ED attendances and emergency admissions? And the, and the data sets to answer them are on the right hand side. And then on the top, you see the average knee arthropl arthroplasty cost by procedure type. Um, we, we, we usually take these things for given, uh, but being in the system, I have realized that you know it, it does take a while to get to this information and hence slows down the decision making proce uh, processes in an organization. Next slide, please. Um, and similarly, most importantly, prompts, right? So patient reported outcome measures um, are a really crucial part of, of value based healthcare. Um, again, which uh, which answer the questions such as how do we measure the value um, and effectiveness of interventions in improving outcomes. And on the right hand chart, you can see uh, the before and after of a, of a patient around uh, their reported prom. Um, so next slide, please, Gareth. Um, similarly for variation, um, I think Alan referred to what is warranted and what is unwarranted. OK, so how varied is the patient journey across Wales? Um, it's it's really important that we that we understand that NHS is a system where variation will exist because it's a complex adaptive system. Um, however, un uh, you know, un un unless we have the mechanisms to visualize and, and analyze the data in, in that way around what is what is warranted and what is unwarranted look like, um, we won't be able to answer the questions. So following on a similar theme, questions around variations, data sets and, and, and the visualization. Next slide, please. Right, so Alan um, talked about the target operating model for the national clinical framework, and I'm going to be talking about how the intelligence for value model serves to that purpose. Now we have developed the intelligence for value framework, which I described to you previously. This is not a static document. As we go through this journey, we will have more and more questions. Um, we will be acquiring those data sets and we will strive to answer those questions on, a, on an ongoing basis. But, but in order to make this real time accessible to the people who need it, integrated in the right systems, this is the sort of process we, we are following. Um, so step one is the model, understand the questions, understand the data sets. Step two, mapping to the existing data sets and understanding the gaps. Step three, once we've identified those gaps, then safely and securely acquire the data sets based on the purpose of the analyses. Um, and, and some of the examples might be primary care data, which at the moment is, is, is not routinely submitted into um, our data warehouses. But of course, if we find a purpose such as diabetes, for example, or other chronic conditions where, where it is really important to look at data, those data sets, then, then there is a case for and a purpose for using that information. Um, I think at the opening session, Audit registry data were mentioned as, as some of the things that are crucial in this journey. So we are on a journey to acquire audit registry data so that we can have this for real time analyses. Um, we're not. So the target operating model is to bring all those data sets into the National Data Warehouse and as Alan described, then into the National Data Resource. Um, and although the, the National Data Resource is still is still in in um, it's still in its um, it's it's forming phase, but we're not stopping at that. We're bringing all these things centrally into the DHCW um, data warehouse so that 
some of these products and data views can be continued to be um, made based on those questions. And most of these products, um, you'll be very pleased to know, are on our website. Um, so hopefully um, one of my colleagues will drop in the link um, for our website and you can access some of those products based on the questions that were asked for specific clinical conditions there. Um, next slide, please, Gareth. Right, so that's that's our journey. Um, uh, we've done a lot of work around the, the, the model and the framework. Um, we are now on to mapping the existing data sets and we've identified the data um, gaps in collection. We're now very well ahead in our journey around bringing those data sets into the DSCW in which things which are in our gift and ultimately into the NDR. Um, next slide, please. And uh, again, I'm repeating the slide, but hopefully this ties up in what Alan was saying around how does how does all this inter intelligence feed into um, things around uh, the local organizations, the networks, uh, the, the 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 policy levels. So um, data when triangulated appropriately at the appropriate level can provide insights into um, all of those areas. And that's and that's the vision of of, of how the intelligence for value will be the engine. Um, Hopefully that's driving this car forward. Um, next slide, please. Um, it also feeds into the value allocation and utilization learning toolkit. And for all of those of you who might not be aware of it, this is this is a um, this is a place where best practice for um, for 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 everything to do with population health and technical efficiencies and system insights can be found um, and is produced by the finance delivery unit and of course a lot of this work and the intelligence from this is going to feed into the um, this, this particular um, uh, framework as well next slide please and last i think last but not least um um wales is 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 getting up to speed with um scan for safety GS1 compliance and many of our health boards have been collecting um, cath lab uh, information and, and soon medical implant information um, on, on a routine basis on, on a patient level. So this will allow the triangulation of, of this particular data into other data sets to identify any inappropriate variation. Um, and most of all, I think most of all, it's all about how do we ensure patient safety? Um, how do we ensure better outcomes? How do we ensure that we are providing the best sort of implants that actually make a difference to the patient's quality of life and be able to triangulate and visualize that? Next slide, please. Um, so before I hand over to, to Chris, um, I'm just going to reiterate um, the, the two points that my colleagues have made previously around the um, the capacity and the capability to do this. We can't really do this alone. Um, many of you would have seen the IDC and the Forrester research um, projections around how far behind are we in terms of analytical capacity and the demand for analytics. It's a global issue. It's not just an NHS issue. Um, our, our demand for analytics is increasing um, on 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 and in, in an exponential uh, way right now, um, and we do have wonderful team um, team skills in 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 our team in value and health, um, including skills on advanced programming, program uh, problem solving, critical thinking. Um, very creative colleagues who bring all these data to life. So, and I'm not going to be going out without here saying that our analysts that produce all this work are the rock stars. Um, and thanks to uh, you know, our, our teams who bring all of those data to life. Um, however, it's not enough. And that's going to beautifully lead me to Chris's presentation around what does the NDR and the advanced analytics um, team bring into um, scaling this up and, and making this um, more meaningful and more scalable for, for the stakeholders that we serve um, in NHS Wales. Thank you very much, Diol Hunwaur. Thanks, Navjot. Um, I'm Chris and I'm representing the National Data Resource and the Advanced Analytics Group that Navjot, Navjot just mentioned. Um, can you go to the next slide, please, please, Gareth? So the National Data Resource is a 10 year programme. We're around about two and a half years into our 10 year programme, so we've still got seven and a half or so years left of this. And the National Data Resource is all about 
um, enabling all this kind of stuff that we've been talking about. There's lots of amazing work being done at the moment, but we're about enabling us to be able to use the, the latest technologies and the, um, all the new fancy ways of working and analysing data. So the National Data Resource is all about identifying where we currently have legacy and legacy systems and all of our architecture is locked down at the moment. It is not very easy to pull data out of it and do stuff with it. So the purpose of the National Data Resource is to open up that central architecture, work with the health boards around Wales so they have access not only to their own but also national data in order to, in order to perform um, analytical um, or um, analysis on it um, to have some national projects as opposed to um, projects which might be locally focused and that's not to say there's not excellent pieces of work being conducted at the moment but excellent national pieces of work are at the moment an exception as opposed to the norm um, and then we're hoping to transform that legacy infrastructure and the way that we're working at the moment into a more, a more modern national approach, very much along the lines that Ian and Navjot have been talking about. Next slide, please, Gareth. Uh, you can see here some little some little quotes. I'm not quite sure if you can read these of various different people that the national data resource will be touching, whether that be whether that be the planners who under, who can plan their resources around um, predictive workloads, the clinicians and the care professionals, the operational staff who are trying to get the job done, the software developers who are helping us create wonderful things technically, and of course the and, our, and the analysts that we've got circled there. And I, I won't read all this out to you, but you get, you, you get the idea that we're talking here about the analysts. So if you can move to the next slide, please, Gareth, I'll explain the advanced analytics group. So the advanced analytics group, it's um, it started off being a lot of people talking about the sort of things they would like to do and that they have done, which is really, really useful. And that gave us a fantastic foundation of knowing what was required. So this isn't about the here and now and what we've done right now is what we're preparing ourselves to do in the future. So we realised there are lots of projects that can be categorised together. So we identified these five thematic work groups along with two more um, working type groups for their um, for analytic tools and analytics capability. So if you see these technical topics here, NLP, chatbots, image analysis, population health and behaviours, prediction and planning, they all have their own, they all have their own purpose. And they're all not they're all not about one particular solution. They're about using this technology in order to help patients, to help clinicians and to help management and planners um, direct the resources in an appropriate way. And then analytics tools, and analytics capability, they're about putting their, uh, their enablers really, their enablers for the, other, for the other five. To give an example of why this might be seen to be a little bit different, so population health and behaviours. As you can see there, if you can read the text on the screen, the chairperson of this group is Dr Louisa Nolan, and she's fantastic. She's the chief data scientist from the ONS. So we're all experts, well, Many of us are experts at analysing the, um, the health data and there are people that will be able to compare the cardiac data to the um, diabetes data to the personal um, identifying kind of data. But this is more about trying to work out where we can, how we can connect this to contextual data, which is where Louisa Nolan from the, from the ONS comes in because she'll be aware of all that other contextual stuff where do people live, where do they go on holiday, um, how much money do they earn, that kind of thing. So we can tie in the health issues and health benefits to all that other circumstantial stuff around the outside of it to see where the where the connections are. And in each one of these themes, there's that kind of work going on. We're trying to use the, we're trying to plan to use the latest technology and whether that's machine learning or um, advanced image analysis, all that kind of, all that kind of stuff. So the idea of each of the first five projects is to come up, first five working groups, is to come up with some collaborative projects. So we've got members of these groups from across the health boards, um, from various different areas, and what they want to do is try and work, try and identify where there can be some true collaborative working opportunities. 
where we can work with universities, with public health wells, with health boards, with central people in DHCW to come up with some groundbreaking ideas. And then if we can prove that these work in proof of concepts, then scale them up for national solutions. Could you move to the next slide, please, Gareth? Uh, I so summarising the advanced analytics group here, and you can see how we're all tying things together. So we're trying to work out who are the best people that we can meet that we, we can be talking to about this, about these innovations. How can we build relationships with academia? Um, so we're we're sponsoring some PhDs across some of the universities, and we're trying to write ways of working and. Um, trying to think of the expressions now, various different contracts with universities so we can work with them to understand what they need out of their research capability and how we can benefit from their from their research and how we can work with them um, and how we can understand our own our own analytic capability and our capacities and help support the careers of those involved in data analytics. Um, next slide please. So the people that we've got in our groups, I mentioned one or two people already, but you can see it's quite an eclectic collection of members on the, on the left hand side there. I won't read them all out, but we've got all sorts of absolutely brilliant minds. Then we've also got people who no doubt are brilliant in their own ways, but more down to earth um, operational folk as well, who can help us tie together what the needs are on the front line and then use these brilliant technical minds to try and understand how we can support the people to make decisions and how we can support them in their day to day roles, how we can support them with planning for the future and of course how we can help the clinicians and the patients because that's what we're all here for. And next and last slide please Gareth. Um, that's just thank you very much. You can see that, that we've spoken from Public Health Wales, Value in Health and the National Data Resource and that's back to Alan. You just on mute there, Alan. Somebody had to do it. Um, yeah, I was furiously writing notes, which is why I forgot to unmute um, and trying to follow the chat bar. I gave up on social media. I see there's some activity on Twitter as well for you, those of you that do that thing. Um, but the, I mean, for, from my point of view, that was three really interesting, really stimulating uh, presentations. It's nice to see that uh, Chris Haberley is literally a, a rock star, um, as Navjot said. I, I noticed that guitar. He's also a bit of a skater boy by the, the looks of all those uh, skateboards on his bookcase, but, but that might just be for show. Sure. I don't know. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to ask some questions. Uh, I did have a planted question um, and I can't see it in the chat bar. Um, but Navjot, I'm going to have a go at remembering the planted question uh, that I was going to put to you from a couple of weeks ago. So I'm, I'm hoping that there's lots of clinicians and, and when I say clinician, I don't just mean doctors, nurses and AHPs. I mean people from finance um, and people from operational management uh, and staff from right across the, the health and care system. I'm hoping there are a lot of clinicians on the call that are interested in this and thinking, great, um, I'm hungry. I don't want dog food, um, so how can I start getting access to this good quality data? Um, so Navjot, what's the kind of the journey for them, if you like, to, to get the, that information? Um, thank you, Alan. That's a, that's an excellent, um, excellent question. Um, um, OK, so um, very, very simply described. I think it's the first of all is being clear about your own question, you know, that that's that's the first, you know, what what is the question you're trying to ask? Um, and, um, you know, from a from a from a value um, in, in health uh, perspective and, and our team perspective, I think there is a there's a few avenues. Um, I think the first first of all is um, each each health board will have their own digital, um, you know, teams and their own data and analytics teams. So worth asking this asking um, your, your, your own local teams uh, this question around. I have this question. Where do I find um, the information about it? Uh, we tend to kind of focus a lot on data, but actually what we're asking is information, right? And most of the time this information is widely available uh, without without. Um, so there is there is quite a few resources on the value in health website which provide the routinely accessible information 
on our website um, and, and, and a list of helpful resources. And I'm sure Chris and Ian will agree with me. There's a, there's a lot of information available, readily available on public health website um, as well. Now, the second part is, well, if that information is not routinely available, then being clear about your questions um, allows the analytical teams to understand what are you trying to um, ask and how can they help you bring in the key um, data sets to be able to analyze or triangulate that information and in that sense i would i would encourage um, our, our stakeholders as you said they're not just clinicians our wider stakeholders do to please 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 get in touch with um, any one of us um, on on the screen and 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 particularly myself if uh, if that helps and um, and we can we can we can signpost you to the right um, the right avenues. We've got a number of products already built on um, and, and released on our website. Now these might not be relevant to you, but these will give you an idea about how analytical products answer your questions. So I, I hope that was not a very long winded answer, um, but summarizing this again, um, contact, you know, be clear about your question, search the uh, the number of information readily available three contact your local teams if you don't get the information there please do feel free to contact us in the value and health team we've got a number of products on our on our website so um and any more questions around how we can help with the intelligence um, we would absolutely be delighted to help thanks uh, thanks very much navjot um so that that's a, a very good answer um, and hopefully that's given you some some pointers. Um, I, I'm I'm looking through the other questions that have come in. I, I'm hoping that some of the questions, particularly some of the ones that were posted earlier in the presentations, may have been answered um, at least partly by some of the presenters. So I may take the questions a little bit out of order. Um, th there was one that I was particularly uh, keen on. I, I thought it was a really good question. And I'd like to maybe ask Ian uh, to have a, a, a go at a, answering this one and then bring the other panellists in as well. Um, and it's what about qualitative data? Um, I, I think this is a really important question um, because we can get trapped into thinking that this is all about uh, quantitative data, all about numbers and, and graphs. But what about the qualitative data? Um, does that have a place in, in data warehouses and things like the, the NDR? So Ian, I'd quite like to get your view on that first, please. Thanks. Thanks, for, thanks very much, Alan. I'm going to go back to a different point in my career in order to answer this. So a long time ago, I was in the Department for Work and Pensions and they were rolling out at the start of Job Seekers Allowance, the mandatory work focused interview. Um, which must take place within four days of a job seekers allowance claim starting. And I remember we had this beautifully big, wonderful evaluation process set up in order to do it. And the senior manager were absolutely loving the fact that actually the first data came through 90.6% of work of work focus interviews were taking place within four days. Jubilation all round until the qualitative part of the evaluation kicked in. And what had transpired was that only 50% of claimants remembered talking about work at all during their work focused interview, which might have defeated the point slightly of it. And the rationale was quite simple for that. People had to know where they were getting money from in order to feed their family before they could move into the next stage of looking for work. And that is where qualitative data has to come into this is you can only get so much from quantitative data and you need the qualitative to substitute. But there is a bad bit of qualitative data in the NHS as well, which is when we use it to evaluate things as a proxy for a proper outcome evaluation. And I think what I want to see a shift is from it being qualitative data is the only bit of evaluation into qualitative data answering the right questions through the parts which quantitative data cannot get to and the two have that place together in order to stop us getting into that trap which uh, illustrated by the example I gave. Well it's what a great answer uh, Ian that, that's a really useful anecdote um, I, I couldn't agree more um, I think 
Um, I, I mean, I've I, I talked a bit about my involvement with uh, Picanet, and that was a really important thing for me in my career. The other things that have been really, really important in, in my career um, as uh, highlights, if you like, of groups that I've been pleased to be involved with um, and definitely include the NDR programme, um, but also laterally the NHS Digital Academy and Tech Cymru, one of the arm's length organisations in Wales who were involved in the implementation of video consultations. What I learned from Tech Cymru and at the NHS Digital Academy is that you need to do mixed methods evaluations. So you need quantitative and you need qualitative. So I, I think it's a really important message to get across and I'm, I'm glad that's come out in, in conversation. OK, I, I'm going to uh, look at my other screen. Sorry, I'm, I, I've got the Starship, Starship Enterprise here, by the way. I've got about five different screens going on here. Um, so he, here's a question. Um, is the work of the Advanced Analytics Group reliant on the new NDR ecosystem to deliver the analytical insights? So, Chris, I'm going to ask you to answer that question, please. Hi, thanks, Alan. Um, the intention of the AAG is to eventually work towards using data which is held by or incorporated within the NDR um, ecosystem. However, at the moment, the work that they're talking about is is enabling to enabling us to do stuff right now. So we're talking about near future anyway. So we're trying to work out together what data we can, what date what's the question that we're trying to solve. So it might be that we have somebody in a health board or somebody centrally or a clinician or a university that says, I've got this question, I need to do this, this will be the benefit. So in each of the working groups, we're having presentations from people and there might be a mixture of professors or, or administration management or from clinicians saying this is what I'm trying to achieve. And then as a group, we try to work out, well, what can we actually do? Not just what we do we like to do because it's really shiny, but what we actually able to do, practically speaking. So we might identify a project. Hey, there's that project there. We can get hold of the data. We've got the governance sorted for that data. We've got a technical um, repository to keep it in. We've got this functionality. This, we have this functionality to allow collaborative working. Yeah, yes, let's go ahead and do that. But that's where, the, that's where we're at the stage right now, is identifying the priority projects um, to work on. So no, we don't need to wait for the full NDR ecosystem to be in place, but that is what we're warming ourselves up to. That, that's great. Thank, thank you, Chris. And that, I mean, my, the way I conceive of the NDR, it's not, it's not that it's an entity. Don't think about it as being an entity. It's about a way of working. And it's a way of thinking about things and it's a, it's a way of uh, designing and a, and, a, and a way of uh, putting things into place architecturally. Um, so thanks very much, Chris. I, I'm going to um, pounce on another question here now. It's a, it's a wee bit technical, but maybe we'll use it as a, 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 a demystifier. Uh, so someone has asked um, if the, the data standards based on HL7 fire, how far have they been implemented and is it for specific data sets. So before I pick on someone to answer that, um, HL7 stands for Health Layer 7. So that's just the, the layer within a database in which health information sits. FHIR stands for Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resource. So if you like, it's a it's a messaging, a messaging or a translating system that allows data in one place to be translated into a, a common language. Um, so uh, Navjot, would you like to have a go at that question and then I'll maybe bring Chris in after you. I just wanted to give Chris a rest. I, I can definitely have a go, um, although that's not my expertise. Um, so I'm going to be putting my hands up. So I, I so from what I do know is there is, um, so within the Value and Health Programme, my colleague Saeed Shadi, um, and I'm not sure whether some of you have attended the session already, is the expert on, uh, on developing some of those um, standards for PROMS data particularly for um, for PROMS data to seamlessly travel. And just as an explanation, these interoperability standards allow systems to talk to each other and data to be transmitted from one system to the other. Am I right, Alan, right? Um, so, um, uh, you know, just to demystify the jargon, uh, 
in in Wales, there is a num number of health boards um, for those of the attendees who are not from Wales. I'm hoping there are some um, and, and we in the health boards collect PROMS data as an example on various different systems. So uh, uh, some of the work that's been led in, in, in the National Value and Health team is all about consistent um, standards to um, bring the PROMS data into the central repository so it can be analyzed and triangulated in a standardized manner. Um, there is more work being undertaken under the wider digital services, um, digital program for patients and services, also called the DSPP program, uh, which will take that lead role into, um, and, and Stephen Frith leads that program, uh, which will take that lead role into um, developing this maturity around standards and how all those other data standards that I mentioned can be then trapped traveling into the NDR. Um, I hope I've started uh, with, a, with a reasonably reliable answer, Alan. <laughs> Good. Um, it sounded plausible to me, Navjot, um, so it's passed that test. Um, so I, I'm going to invite Chris to come back in. Did you have anything to add there, Chris, uh, about the uh, how far HL7 Fire has got? Right, so to give a little, I haven't got a clear answer and I feel like a bit of a politician here. So, so the, the, the work happening right now for the NDR, the, the most amount of work of the central work is focusing on architectural building blocks. And there's two sections of the architectural building blocks, which right now we're writing the vision. So you've got a bunch of clever technical architects who are, who are building and who are designing the vision of the foundation of the national data resource. And they're focusing on, on enabler blocks and data blocks. And it's those enabler blocks which create foundations for all of the other, all of the data acquisition, the sharing, and the analysis, and moving the data back and forth, which is where which is where we start to use the HL7 Fire standard. And this is the um, the high level approach that we're, that we're that we're proposing to use for the national data resource. And we're going to spend the next um, the next few months proving this vision for the infrastructure of the national data resource so that eventually everything which is coming into and moving through the national data resource is done so using HL7 FIRE. At the moment that's our proposal that we're going through and that we're testing right now. Great, uh, thank you Chris and that, that's very useful. Um, Okay, I see there's still more questions coming in, but there's another one that was earlier on that I'd, uh, I'd quite like to put to Ian. Um, so dashboards, we're back to the old dashboard fetish here, Ian. Uh, data dashboards are good for providing quick generic overviews of data, but how do we avoid the misinter misinterpretation of these quick overviews? And do we always need to do a more in-depth analysis before making important decisions? So Ian. So I think the first thing to do with a dashboard is make sure you've got the time series. Too often they sit there with red, amber and green and actually that and too often they will bounce about because most data is naturally quite noisy. And too often we're celebrating the success of a natural variation and then beating people up for the uh, for a regressing to the mean um, and going back to its long state average. So unless you've got a long time series, and I don't just mean the last 12 months, I mean much longer than that in order to do it, then be very careful about over interpreting the dashboard. A good dashboard will have long time series around it, which enables you to take better. The second core part, though, is actually trying to work out what question are we trying to answer here? And then thinking through whether the information you have is sufficient to take that, the decision you're taking or not. And so, for example, if you've got increasing turnaround times in order to, um, let's say, and testing in public health Wales in a, in a circumstance, and you've got the turnaround times uh, getting worse and worse and worse, then that doesn't tell you how to fix it. That tells you you've got a problem in order to go away and do more work on. And therefore, it's steering you about what the course of action is 
and actually probably in most instances a dashboard will steer you towards a deep dive and further evaluation in order to get it but on some instances it will be obvious what the cause is and what you need to do and in which case don't let the analysis paralysis type of thing stop but it really all comes down to working out what you really want to know and what decision are you trying to take and whether that data is sufficient Great, thank you, Ian. I uh, couldn't agree more. Na Nav Jock, could you come in there as well, please? No, thank you very much, and Ian, great answer. I'd just like to build on what Ian has said. And um, a while ago, I did a research on the critical success factors of um, the adoption of business intelligence in the NHS. And then what came out of that research was the concept around personas. Um, now, it's, uh, you know, it, as I mentioned earlier, each professional group um, consumes information visualizes information in a slightly different way. So we need to be mindful of um, the ways that clinicians particularly um, look at information and what matters to them and how do they want to visualize this information versus finance uh, colleagues who who have a very different set of requirements and a very different way to um, consume that information. Um, that in itself influences whether people start using those dashboards or whether they think um, you know it's not worth it. Um, it is it is a um, it is a slightly tricky, um, you know, it does require that those kind of skill sets, but a key skill that analysts and 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 I've seen this in our teams is, uh, you know, our analytical teams are very, very capable around that nuance um, around, uh, you know, engaging with the relevant audience. Um, but that skill set also needs to be developed around how we visualize that information to make it meaningful for those personas. And that's really, really crucial as well. Um, so it's not, unfortunately, it's not a one size fits all. It's a one size fits all for what the answer the dashboard is trying to give, which is, should be the one version of truth. But there, there has to be those concept of using appropriate storytelling, visualization um, techniques that engage the users to want to know more. Thanks very much, Navjot. OK, I'm going to give my panellists a couple of minutes rest because there, there is a, a question in the panel that's di um, in the sidebar rather that's directed to me. And um, so I'll have a go at answering this uh, before going on to another one that's come in about clinical engagement. Um, so the, the, the question I, I was being asked is about the, the National Clinical Framework and the, the quality management system and the, the relationship between what we've heard about today uh, and quality planning quality control and quality improvement so it's, a, it's a really good question i'm not going to spend too long answering it um, but i would certainly invite the person asking the question to get in touch with me offline because this is a this is a topic of very active discussion that i'm involved with uh, colleagues in welsh government and the quality team in trying to address the the whole concept the whole basis of a learning health and care system uh, is really a qi cycle um, it's a QI cycle powered by data and both quantitative and qualitative, da qualitative data like we've just been discussing. Um, I, I think there, uh, I've put forward an idea that uh, uh, in the implementation of the National Clinical Framework um, that that uh, quality management programme would sit as one of the hexagons interfacing or maybe it's a polyhedron because there's quite a lot of stuff going on, but it's one of the shapes that's interfacing with that national clinical framework piece at the at the centre. And um, so I'm sorry if that's a slightly obtuse answer, but it's something that's under discussion at the moment. And please do get in touch with me, uh, you know, through Teams or or through an email, and um, if you were the person asking that question. So I, I'm going to scroll down now. There was a, a question that came in a couple of minutes ago, um, which. It's obviously of interest to me, but I'd be interested to get the others take on this. How, how do we engage clinicians to capture data on top of what they're already doing? Uh, and there's a, I, I guess there's a, a secondary question to that is where can we access the NDR? So taking that second point first, I'm just going to re-emphasise, think of the NDR as not as a thing, but as a, a way of working. Uh, but I suppose if I rephrase that question, then how do we how do clinicians access what's going to be made available through that NDR way of working? Uh, Chris, I'd like to come to you on that because I know this has been a, a topic of conversation for a long time now in the NDR programme. 
Thank you, Alan. Well, part of the vision of the National Data Resource is to develop applications which are patient facing, which are clinician facing and which are administration facing. However, I don't want to get people's hopes up and expectations up where right now we're still just delivering the vision of those initial architectural building blocks. So there's some way off because this is a this is a 10 year program. But the idea is to do just that, is to put the information where it's needed in order to make decisions, whether they be clinical decisions or managerial decisions. So it will be there and it will happen, but it's going to be a few years yet in the main. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, and I, I mean, I think I would add my view here, obviously from a clinical background, I've got fairly strong views on this and I've been thinking about it for a very long time. Um, I think we need to recognise that uh, understanding data and engaging in all the sorts of stuff we've been discussing for the last uh, just under hour and a half is actually part of your job uh, potentially as a as a clinician. Um, and actually, it's an it's not a, an add on extra part of your job. It's an integral part of your job. And again, that's one of the I suppose the messages about developing a so-called learning health and care system that people come to understand that, that this is part of their job. It becomes part of their role. Um, so there's not a quick answer to that um, and it will depend on what professional background you're in particularly. Uh, but it, it's as much a cultural change as, as anything else. But I think it's a really important one and, and one that we need to address. Um, do any of my other panellists want to come in on that clinical engagement? Yeah, Ian, uh, go, go ahead, please. And then Navjot. Ian first. Thanks very much, Alan. I think there's also something on us in the centre when we're asking for data to design it in so it's simple and easy and part of the digital transformation already mentioned through digital services for the patient and public. I think too often at the moment we're asking clinicians to collect data that's already collected elsewhere in the system and we've got to design in this interoperability to make the data available where it's needed, when it's needed, mm -hmm. so that you know as clinicians that when you're being asked to collect a bit of data it's genuinely because you're the one place in the system where we can get the value add into the system and get the learning out of it from there. But I think too often um, we're asking people to type in yet again for the 300th time the same bit of information about an individual and that's why I think we've got the fatigue in the system around data and I think it's up to us to design it out through the digital developments we're undertaking, make it easy and then make sure we develop products back which add the value back to clinicians so that they can see the value they're getting from it because too often at the moment it's felt as though the data is being collected for others in order to monitor waiting times ambulance rather than value add information which will really make a difference to their jobs so i think there's a big onus not just on uh, not just on clinicians to view it as part of their job but us to make sure that, that clinicians know it's there to help them and has value add. Really good point, Ian. Uh, I agree. Navjot. Yes, I thanks. Um, I'm just going to add a little bit to that um, and, and two parts of the question. I think in my um, in my presentation, I did say that 80% of what we need is in our gift. I think that's really important to remember. Um, so although we, we are waiting for the NDR, we can still do a lot of things around, um, you know, triangulating um, for for providing information. Um, that brings me to my second point around data literacy and digital literacy. Um, and Alan, you already mentioned about, you know, some of those key skills to be developed to be able to be um, data literate. And the Intelligence for Value Framework is a really good place to start around what sorts of questions have we compiled? They're all on our website and what sorts of data sets exist. So I'd encourage our, our colleagues to, to really um, take the chance and, and go into it and figure figure some of those questions out and, and, and really um, immerse themselves in, the, in, in this world of, of, of data and digital. Um, the last but not the least thing, it's an evangelical statement, is be the change you want to see in the world. Um, so, so it is clunky, it takes time, um, 
but actually a lot of us here are a very very um, approachable individuals so if you if you if you don't understand something we're only an email away we're only a, a twitter away ask us these questions you'll be surprised on how helpful we are <laughs> Uh, thanks, Navjot, um, and I would fully expect you to make an evangelical statement. I would have been uh, disappointed if, <laughs> if you hadn't. Um, so, um, I, I, I'd like to um, I'd like to ask Ian a question. I'm going to take chair's prerogative here. Um, I, I, one of the things that was really interesting and struck me during Ian's presentation was drawing attention to how how much worse inequalities have become, how they've been magnified by COVID. And of course, they do predate COVID. And actually, population health is action two of the, the national clinical framework. It, it forms quite an important component of it. Ian, I wonder if you've got anything to, to say uh, briefly on this, the sorts of tools and techniques that we might use to, to understand uh, the health of our populations a, a bit better. And, and how we might identify where those people live and how we target interventions. Yeah, I'll give this a shot. I think there's like a few bits to this. I think the first is an innovation which came through the pandemic of actually routinely asking people about health harming behaviours. And actually, I think in the past, what we've done is ask it once a year and then rub our hands afterwards and rub our foreheads and go, oh, that's bad, isn't it? Rather than actually get closer to real time understanding about the population and their health, behavior, healthy behaviours and otherwise and ability to take action. So I think the first thing is about right time to do it. The second is that public health is kind of in a bit different space from many of the other interventions we do, which are highly clinical in nature, where often they're being developed locally with innovation around them. And actually, we know less about evaluating and we need to develop, in my view, a system to support local areas, evaluate quickly what's working and what's not and respond in our in things like smoking cessation, cessation uh, healthy eating etc and it's always struck me and it's one where i'm looking into it but i can't promise anything in world of ministry of justice had a similar issue many charities and others were working with reoffenders but didn't know whether their interventions would work they set up a system called Justice Data Lab where they could submit who they'd worked with and MOJ would use a technique called propensity score matching, which gets as close as you can from observational data to a randomised control trial and send the charity back and publish um, evaluation quality insight into whether it's working or not. And I think we've got to begin to think about how we support and enable the system through that closer to real time learning on population and public health in order to deliver some of it. And the third is really the world of big data where we're getting a lot more real time behaviour through which can be used to track and monitor through different uh, social media sites, but also tools like people logging Fitbits, logging and running uh, their Strava and cycling. And how do we utilise that in order to understand population health as well? So I think there's particular opportunities in the non-clinical end in order to do more innovative and to support clinicians in their innovation and to learn rapidly what works. Thank you. Um, uh, that's uh, a, a great answer, Ian. Um, and, and I think that that's a, a nice way to, to end the session. We've only got a couple of minutes left. And um, so I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank, uh, well, thank the audience for attending. I hope it's been as interesting and, and useful for you in the audience as it has been for me. Um, I, I, we met as a group two or three weeks ago to to kind of plan what we were going to talk about today. And that in itself was a really interesting conversation for me. Uh, and, and today has just been fascinating. I've, I've taken lots of notes uh, myself, which probably ex explains my uh, less than optimal chairing abilities because I was too busy scribbling notes. Um, so thank you um, other panellists for participating. And I'd really like to thank the Value and Health team um, for asking me to chair the session. I always feel extremely flattered when they ask me to be involved because I'm so impressed with the work that they do 
um, and, and it's going to really build a, a strong foundation for the health and care system in Wales over the next decade if it's allowed to flourish uh, and, and if we actually continue to walk the walk. Um, but uh, yeah, there we go. I, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, thanks very much, everyone. And uh, you know, don't forget, you can get in, in touch with us offline as well. Cheers now.